And now we are recording. So hello everyone, my name is Katayun Madani. I am one of the co-chairs of Incision, the International Student Surgical Network. And I would like to welcome you to the HeLa Space and Oath Undone. Um, today's webinar is going to focus on the education and health outcomes of the communities of color. And we're very excited to have this discussion with you. Uh, just prior to the start of the um, uh, presentations and the conversations that we're going to have, I would like to invite everyone um, to take a, a few moments and participate in a, a pre-webinar survey that we have created. The link for the survey is going to be in the main um, chat box. The link is provided. Please take a few moments to participate in this survey. The um, housekeeping uh, items that we want to cover today before anything else are the chat boxes and the Q&A box. On the right hand side of your panel, you have a chat box that you can communicate with everyone during the webinar through. Uh, make sure that you choose the uh, correct, um, the correct uh, audience for your message. When you have a drop down there, you can actually um, look at the uh, drop down menu and select the right uh, audience. Someone was messaging that they did not receive the survey link. Uh, please double check and see if you can see it now. Uh, it should be to all panelists and attendees. And below the uh, window, you have a, a set of tools. One of them is a Q&A window. If you click on that Q&A window, you can submit questions to us at the, um, after the circle towards the end of the webinar. We would be answering some of your questions and we'd be excited to see them in that Q&A uh, um, box. So please share them with us and we will uh, make sure to get to them. So just to uh, give you a little background about why this webinar is um, being hosted today and where the entire idea came about, in 1951, uh, Mrs. Henrietta Lacks, a 31-year-old uh, African-American housewife, was diagnosed by, um, with cervical cancer and became a patient at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Throughout the course of her treatment, Mrs. Lax had multiple biopsies done and some of her tumor cells were expanded in the lab and the scientists at the time realized that her cells had an interesting property, that they could grow and multiply for days without having any problems, without changing in nature or without the cell line dying. So they called her cells immortal, immortal cell line. This became uh, a reason why her cell, cells became really valuable to use in medical research and um, became part of uh, many uh, medical experimentations and discoveries. Unfortunately, Mrs. Lax passed away within a few months of her um, diagnosis. And um, during the time, it was not customary to ask patients for con consent for this type of use of her tissues. Um, however, never after this um, incidence of being biopsied and the tissues being ex expanded, even when the consent process became customary, did her family or um, any of uh, her children, her husband, been made aware or asked for a consent uh, for the use of her tissues in medical experimentations. Over the last 70 years, um, HeLa cells, Henrietta Lacks cells, have traveled the globe multiple times and they have uh, been part of the majority of the medical discoveries from polio vaccine to treatments for flu to cancer drugs such as tamoxifen. And they have contributed not only to the healing of millions and millions of people and uh, prevention of disease, but also to a um, large portion of what is the medical um, uh, and healthcare industry. Her family has never received compensation uh, for any of the um, contributions that were uh, coming from her cells. And today, uh, we thought that it was important in the context of discussions of structural racism that we discuss um, her story as well um, as the effect of her story in the context of uh, the effect it has had in the healthcare and how healthcare is viewed by the communities of color. 
this is an important story as many of us who are trained uh, in, in medicine or in science are familiar with HeLa cells. However, the story is often untold. So um, we are dedicating this webinar today to the memory and contributions of Mrs. Henrietta Lacks and we're thankful for um, the enormous sacrifice that her and her family have made. With that, um, we, I want a little bit touch up, touch up on why we are overall hosting the webinar to begin with, why to have this conversation at all. As you're aware, over the past few months, there have been um, demonstrations, uh, protests around the globe um, against racism, uh, not just in America, but in many countries. We have had many conversations about structural racism. We have had time uh, to take moments of reflection uh, individually, hopefully, and as institutions, and uh, really think about what needs to change. And in doing that, Incision and our partnering organizations, we wanted to have an actionable item. We wanted to uh, do more than just lend our voice and our support for what was happening around us. And in that regard, we thought one of the best ways to do that is to have these conversations, one, and two, to have actionable items to teach our uh, community about implicit bias. When you look at implicit bias training, however, from the medical community standpoint, uh, while it's done, the training, it's not very successful. And the reason for that is the medical community and healthcare providers as a whole uh, partake in the Hippocratic Oath and the belief, wholehearted belief, in fact, that they treat everyone equally. And this belief is so strong that it makes it difficult for them to understand, for all of us to understand and accept that we as humans have bias. And um, to look at that and to gain to that, get to that acceptance and to deal with that um, discomfort of that acceptance, with the guilt of that acceptance even, um, we wanted to incorporate the Kubler-Ross grief model into this um, sphere of training and conversation. So this webinar today is a precursor to the training that is going to be held. I will describe the, uh, the details of the training and the uh, dates um, that are coming up at the end of the webinar today. Uh, the training is going to be an exciting opportunity for everyone to partake in, uh, members of Incision and uh, uh, partnering organizations, as well as others who are interested. And we're excited to have this webinar today to describe what the training will be and how um, this can be a step forward uh, and um, how we can all be part of this change. So just before uh, we start the conversations, I would like to thank uh, everyone who is pre present with us today. Being part of this webinar is a um, great contribution by everyone who is on this panel, everyone who is participating in this circle as they have accepted to be part of a very uncomfortable and difficult conversation. And we are very thankful to everyone who's here. I would like to introduce everyone uh, one time by their titles. You have seen the bios of our incredible um, circle and presenters uh, all over the uh, social media, but I just want to introduce everyone by their names and titles once as one, when we move into the circle, all these titles will be stripped and everyone has agreed and actually encouraged to enter um, into this um, circle as uh, their first name, by their first name, as their own individual human self. So, just wanted to say thank you and welcome to Dr. Anita Watwa, um, Dr. Mamta Swaroop, Ms. Leslie Lux, Ms. Eudora Gatewood, Dr. Mark Schreim, Professor Emmanuel Ame, Dr. Kwali Hussein, and uh, His Excellency Ambassador, Dr. Neil Parson. With that, I would like to pass the uh, microphone to Dr. Mamta Swaroop, or Mamta as of this point, uh, so that she can take on the webinar. Thank you. Mamta, you're mute. <laughs> of course I am. Um, this is very exciting for me. Thank you uh, for that lovely like synopsis of, of uh, what's happening. So I know in some parts of uh, the world, it is after lunchtime or it's during lunchtime. Uh, and so as we start uh, this process, uh, it's always good to take a nice stretch as we're about to sit down. 
right? And with our social distancing and all, right, it's, you know, we can't be near people. But if you're somehow in like some groups of people, before we actually get started in, in doing, um, you know, before you get to watch people doing a circle, um, and, you know, I thought it would be kind of fun to do a little activity. So if you have a friend nearby, join together, or, you know, let's just in our minds think, uh, you know, if you were with your bestie, okay, uh, and you were sitting with them, and you were in an arm wrestling position, so everyone, at least uh, my panelists, let's, let's do the arm wrestling position, all right, okay? And we're in an arm wrestling position. All right, Anita, it's you and me, babe. All right. And, uh, you know, in 30 seconds, all right, all right, our job is to get the back of the hand of the other person down in 30 seconds as many times as possible. All right. How many times do you think you could get that done? Feel free in the chat to tell me, Ikeys, tell, feel, feel free in the chat to tell me how many times you think that could actually happen. Okay. Anybody from uh, my uh, panelists who want to, you know, unmute and tell me? No? I'm pretty strong, so um, I'm going to say I can do this. About 15 times. Okay, Gatewood. Times. Calm down. <laughs> okay. Who are, you, who are you playing with? Who are you play, playing with, Gatewood? Your, your kiddo? Uh, <laughs> hey, Mark, uh, you know, if you and I were playing, how many times do you think you and I could, uh, could do this? Sorry, did you, did you say my name? Yeah, absolutely, Mark. Yeah, I think, uh, I think we talk first and we just uh, make a point to not resist each other and we get a lot more than, uh, than fighting. Absolutely. So I think you and I could probably get like maybe 60. All right. So the purpose of this, okay, is that if we fight each other, okay, we don't actually accomplish anything. Okay. Because the goal is really to get our hands, the back of each other's hands down. The, the goal is never to fight or resist and prevent the other person's goal to be accomplished. So if we collaborate and we work together with our partners, okay, we are going to achieve so much more. If, however, we work against each other, we're not going to achieve very much. And, you know, this group, of humans that we have talking about um, on this panel are our surgeons, hmm, right? And all kind of in a, in a specific sphere, all right? And that's why we're, I have the high income countries and low and middle income countries here. And I think it makes even more of a difference when we take this specific instance of taking a cone, a red cone, if you imagined, and inside of an opaque box. If you have a group of people who are looking from peephole A, that group of people, all right, are going to see one thing, and the group of people, another group from peephole B will see something completely different. And peephole A group and peephole B group will completely and utterly fight each other just as if we aren't seeing that playing arm wrestling we could actually win if we are doing more in trying to figure out what's actually inside of the box they'll fight each other saying this is a triangle and this is something circular okay but if they stop to think that they could work together they could potentially see something even more and when we're looking at implicit bias, when we're looking at structural racism, when we're looking at racism, when we're looking at neocolonialism, however you want to cut the word, right? And we're looking at that as our cone, all right? 
it is not one aspect that is looked at to make it right or wrong. Okay. It's not people A or people B even, right? We have to make holes all over this cube to try to actually figure out how to break down that object to how to figure out how to break down and fix and realize that cone that's inside that opaque box. We have to look at how countries are dealing with things, how our access to education will improve health outcomes, what racial disparities can be improved immediately upon, our social determinants of health, our security, how if you're worried about security, of your day to day, how does that affect your health? How does that affect your jobs? How does that affect all sorts of things? Until then, if we continue to think that people A and people B are the only things that exist and the only ways of looking at structural racism, we will fail. I have to dedicate this entire idea to my mom because. The only reason I knew of Kubler-Ross was because I was grieving my mother uh, when I thought through this. So I have to put her, uh, at least mention her for a second. So thanks. Um, and now I get to uh, introduce Dr. Anita Vadva, um, who is an amazing human for a multitude of reasons. Um, she is a native Houstonian and she is a teacher. She's an English teacher at, and also a restorative justice uh, expert. Um, and she's a coordinator at Yes Prep Northbrook High School. She's also authored um, Restorative Justice in Urban Schools, Disrupting the School to Prison Pipeline and a contributor to the recently released anthology, Colorizing Restorative Justice. She's also the co-founder of Restorative Justice Empowerment, or RAY, and she hires and trains former students to train organizations in Houston in restorative practices. She owes everything to her parents, her husband, and her two lovely daughters, Anita, also happens to be my best friend and we've known each other since we were nine years old and it gives me immense pleasure to welcome and to introduce, doc introduce Dr. Anita Vadva. Thank you, Mamta. That was very kind and I love you. Um, so I would like to start with a quick poll not the poll that you've already done, but we have an interesting collaboration right now between a high school, recent high school graduate, Leslie, educators, surgeons, my dad is out there somewhere. So this is more targeted towards the medical professionals on the call. In your medical training, when you were, learned about HeLa cells, did you also learn about the story of Henrietta Lacks? that Katyun mentioned earlier. So if you could just go ahead and fill out that poll, Katyun, whenever the majority of people have, have participated, we can just get a pulse of, of people's knowledge on the call, or rather their training, not their current knowledge. The poll is anonymous, by the way. Please uh, don't be shy. Go ahead and uh, respond. Yeah, this is not a gotcha question. We're, we're really trying to understand um, how doctors are trained. So if you want to just go ahead and share for whatever amount of participants we already have. Okay, so almost even, but 60% but of the training of the cell of Hilo, which is named after a black woman 
whose cells have been used to create all sorts of discoveries, including the polio vaccine, was not described to you. So most of us learned about Henrietta Lacks from HBO, from Oprah's movie, or Leslie, they, they're now teaching it in high school. So it's interesting that in medical schools, that was not valued as something that needed to be told, okay? So I just wanna start there, just, just so we get a sense of the training that you've had. So I am Anita Vadva, and I am co-founder, as Mumta stated, of Restorative Empowerment for Youth. My other co-founder is Udoro Ekpin Gatewood, who will be participating in the virtual circle later. And right now we have a lead youth facilitator, Leslie Lux, who is only 18 years old and will be facilitating the circle. So what we do is we train our young people in the high school in restorative justice, which I will give an overview of briefly. And then once they've graduated, we even have some high school students, we hire them as full-time consultants. What we found is a lot of times restorative justice has become a field that is professionalized and people are making a lot of money off of it, but the people on the ground in the community who are really organically doing it, their work is not valued. So Doro and I, as women of color who had seen that pattern, uh, decided we're just gonna start our own um, consultancy and hire our young people. Um, I started teaching in 2001 in Houston, Texas, and one phenomenon that I participated in that I was not even aware of was the school to prison pipeline. So an issue that really gets in the way of teacher and student success is school discipline. We always hear, okay, schools are a mess. Um, but honestly, the way that adults have structured schools oftentimes creates this mess. So I was at a school that was largely immigrant from about 80 countries. Um, but Occasionally, we would have students who would create a lot of disruptions, and as new teachers, we'd say, just get them out of the classroom. I don't want to deal with them. When I left the classroom, because the discipline issues just seemed, I was able to build relationships, but it just seemed like the system was broken. I learned about the school to prison pipeline, and patterns such as 51% of students in public schools are white, yet only 31% receive the multiple suspensions. Zero tolerance is a policy that says you um, cussed at a teacher, now you're going to be suspended for three days. Students who get suspended are more likely to end up in the juvenile justice system and then potentially in the criminal justice system and to drop out. So this is called the school to prison pipeline. Black students are generally two to three times more likely to get school suspensions, often for similar infractions. So I learned about this phenomenon of restorative justice, and I decided when I moved back to Houston, we needed to have this in our schools. So to give you an overview, restorative justice, it's a process to involve as much as possible the entire community. So when harm happens in a school, you don't just say, you hurt this other person, we're gonna send you out of the classroom, and then you'll come back, we won't discuss it. We wanna address harms, needs, and obligations, and try to heal things as much as possible. A nice simple way of looking at this is in punitive justice, we often ask what law was broken, who did it, how are we gonna punish? In restorative justice, we convene community members because we know that when one person is harmed, it ripples out to an entire community. And we find out what happened, what was the impact, and what can be done to make it right. So right now, because you're gonna be looking at a circle in a few minutes, we wanted to give you an example of what we mean by a circle practice. And in the circle, you're going to see a harm that was addressed uh, in, in Canada between a young man and his social worker and how they use the circle process to address the harm. Jamie 
uh, is a young person who uh, found himself in conflict with the law uh, after an incident occurred uh, between um, him and a social worker. He was trying to get me away from the door, and that's where I got my bruises on my arms, um, and because he kept pushing me against the, uh, the filing cabinet. When I got to the office, um, I was just shaking. I didn't realize how much bruising there was and everything, and um, and it was at that point my, my supervisor said, well, you know you're gonna have to charge him. The Crown uh, attorney felt that the uh, young person would benefit from a healing to wellness court program. In Jamie's particular case, uh, he had a lot of supports, uh, and he personally felt that uh, he was at risk of losing those uh, supports if he didn't um, acknowledge the harm that was caused. And restorative justice was felt to be the most appropriate way to amend those relationships, to offer Jamie the opportunity to discuss how uh, he felt and perhaps why he behaved the way he did. It was the most culturally appropriate and culturally sound way to deal with this justice matter. The first time I met him, we're talking about a youth that had struggles in his life and, and going through so much, and um, he was pretty angry. And I do an assessment with them so that I understand more about what it is that they need. And then I make the call on who will be a part of that circle. Restorative justice offers the community the ability to give input and to uh, reshape relationships and provides um, a space to do that where there is equality amongst all of the participants. Jamie was a little nervous, I guess, because I think this was like being able to confront the person that he had done harm with. Because it was a person that he knew very well. I'm going to do the first round. And the first round, we're just going to say our name, what it is that we're here for, what we do, and pass the feather around. So I'm going to start. My name is Yul I was being put into a different foster home, which I did not like. It wasn't really my decision, really. I either had to go there or that's pretty much my only choice. I guess my foster mom at the time needed a break from me, and I didn't really like that. So I was saying stuff like what I felt and what things that I was going through and apologizing, you know? I said, I'm just sorry, and then it won't happen again and that I got better, that I'm the, I'm the new Jamie. When he apologized, it was a welcome surprise for me to hear it, yeah. But me and his foster mom started crying at that point because he's, she's never heard it too, so it was, it was really good to hear from him. I was glad I was able to tell him that I, I loved and cared about him and that I was hoping that uh, we would be able to repair our relationship again and start working on goals for him, not just for me, but goals for a better future for him. I think it's important that we, uh, we stand behind Jamie and listen to him uh, and continue to have open ears to how he's feeling um, and what he feels he needs to do to move forward. It's so a healing he's going through now, so to be an adult and continue to, you know, get ready for his next step of life. He liked building. He wanted to know how to make a drum. And that was one of the recommendations that was put in place. How do you feel about um, what he has shared with us today? I accept his apology. He spoke of his difficulties in changing some of his behavior. I was able to see him in a different light and look at him uh, at what he was going through because he never told me before. It was a, it was a good healing process. Yeah, it ended up including the foster parent too, so which is good. 
I felt that it was very necessary for me to be in that circle because I knew that after everything was said and done that I've got a second chance and that I could keep going. When um, we're able to go around in circle and and hug each other or you know shake hands and and whatnot, then you know that everybody's feeling good leaving here, and that for them to be able to make amends like that, to me, that's already progress. To open up that communication, to open up that understanding, to open up that relationship again, I think that was. I couldn't ask for anything more. So the reason that we want to show you this circle is because a lot of times people think restorative justice was invented in the 1970s by criminologists because Howard Zare, who's the father in the field, brought this term to basically the public. But this actually comes from indigenous people. And so people ask, what do you mean by restorative justice? So in this circle, relationships existed prior to the harm, which means that they could be restored. However, if you're bringing together a party that harmed and the person who was harmed and they don't have a relationships, then we're not trying to restore a relationship. We're trying to restore people's humanity as opposed to just canceling them. So we just want to acknowledge that the roots of restorative justice, they're from indigenous people worldwide, and we know that indigenous people are not a monolith. Um, Edward Valandra, who grew up on the Sioux Reservation, uh, says that non-Indigenous people who practice restorative justice without acknowledging the harms that were done to their community um, are being very hypocritical. So he suggests, for example, they had a feather as their talking piece, that something that you can do when you have an important circle is acknowledging that harm existed. So in the case of Henrietta Lacks's case, how do we know that, how can we address the harm if we first are not acknowledging that Johns Hopkins engaged in a harm? Because there has been no formal apology. So he suggests that by acknowledging it, you can do it through a land acknowledgement and the talking piece can have soil from the land and you can say the land on which you stand belongs to and you can talk about the people who came before you. So in Houston, and I may not be, um, I'm still researching, so I'm still learning the pronunciation, but it's Karankawa, uh, Akokisa, Atacapa, Ishak, and Sana peoples. So if we apply this to the medical system, uh, most of you, you are in the field, so you know that there's injustice there already. So an example is Black and Hispanic patients are significantly less likely to receive pain. Either their pain is not believed or they are seen as that they can withstand the pain more than white patients. Also, um, in this study, they relied on not just the implicit association test that came out of Harvard, which a lot of people have found that there's some issues with the science behind that. There were different ways to measure bias. So physicians who showed a high bias were more likely to dominate conversations and not listen to the concerns of their patients. And as well, they often use language like, we're gonna take our medicine, right? Just being condescending to black patients, which then created a lack of trust. And so what I'd like you to do in the chat right now, you're experts, you're also practitioners, and you're also human. So can you help brainstorm to give us again as a pulse, as the educators in K through 12, what are harms in the medical system that you think could be addressed through restorative justice? That is a very broad question but we'd like to start brainstorming what that might look like in the medical community. 
So I'm going to give you a few minutes, I'd say two minutes in the chat to drop in. What are some issues in the medical community that could be addressed through this community-led justice? I think what's interesting to people who aren't in the medical field is we often hear about the mistreatment of patients of color, but there's not so much focus on the mistreatment of medical professionals of color. So I'm seeing a mix here of health literacy, compliance, and mentoring. Again, we're not acknowledging patients. Patients of color don't always have the same access to healthcare. We may operate in stereotypes, and we literally have the phrase abuse of students by teachers, not really listening. And tests, and that's true, science that has been, um, science that evolved from the idea that one race is superior to another, right? The history of brains being measured. Um, to determine who, which race was intelligent or not. So these are all, we're just spitballing here. We have not seen a lot in literature about restorative justice and harms in the medical community. And, our, and this is being applied everywhere. This is being applied in corporations, not just in schools, community groups. Leslie has done it in her family. You can do it with one-on-one -on -one relationships. And so that's kind of what we're trying to imagine here is, what could restorative justice look like in the work that you do? Um, yes, it isn't just about race. It applies to socioeconomics. But I will say in a lot of the studies that actually control for socioeconomics, race is still an overarching factor. So it's not to ignore that. Um, there's also around gender as well. Um, but, but given, particularly in this times of COVID, um, the stark disparities, even controlling for socioeconomic status for Black and Hispanic patients. Um, that's kind of where, why our focus is resting here. So, and I just wanna close by saying who drives restorative justice? So in this photo, I believe this is 2013, the grandchildren of Henrietta Lacks were told, okay, now you can be included in the process with the National Institute of Health of how we, vet who gets to have access to these cells. And that was the way that they were trying to, I guess, repair harm. But the thing of it is, if you committed the harm, you do not get to decide how you're gonna repair the harm. You actually need to listen to the people who were harmed. And so Johns Hopkins says, they've worked with family members to develop programs, to recognize and honor lax. They've created scholarships and a historical exhibit but the family has stated over and over again in the press, we've been living with this for years. It is getting to the point where it is the principle of everything. So if we are going to be undoing the harms that are in the medical community, the people with the power are not the ones who are allowed to say, we're gonna build an institution in her name. You have to gather a space, convene an actual space in which you have to listen to one another and there is more equity and we rely on the circle process as a very efficient container to do that. And so right now you're going to be able to see that in action. Also, there has to be community in the first place for things to be restored. So what we're trying to model today is how can you create a container with your colleagues, 
where you're going to openly speak about these issues so we can begin trying to get to that healing and change these institutional isms that we're elevating. So I'm going to pass it on right now to my co-founder, Udoro Ekpin Gatewood, as well as my student and now colleague, Leslie Lux, and they are going to model for us what this process might look like. All right. Um, good afternoon now. Um, so something that we're going to start, like uh, Dr. Vara mentioned, my name is Leslie. I'm one of her former students. Uh, now I'm her colleague. Um, so we are going to start with some mindfulness. Um, so we also always like to start our trainings with some mindfulness to keep our body present and to just make sure that we're listening not only to our bodies, but also um, being present in what we're um, being involved in. So if everybody could, um, even participants, panelists, everyone join me with this. Uh, so have your straight back, put your feet straight on the ground. All right, so close your eyes. And if you don't feel comfortable closing your eyes, stare at a spot in the ground, in your ceiling, and at your, at your wall. Um, all right, so take a deep breath in. Take a deep breath out. Inhale. Exhale. And as you're breathing in, breathe in all the positivity. And when you're breathing out, breathe out all the negativity that you have. Breathe in, breathe out. Notice any tense areas that you may have, maybe your shoulders, your spine, your knees. If your mind starts, starts to wander off, focus back on your breathing. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale, exhale. We're going to do two more breathings. Inhale. Exhale. One more last time. Inhale. And release. And when you're ready, you could open your eyes. All right, um, so I hope that helped with brightening your day. Maybe you're present now. Maybe you are in the moment. Um, a few norms that I want to go over before we start um, an activity and move on to the circle. Um, so panelists, we encourage you to keep your camera on. Um, your face offers feedback, but also be mindful of your expressions. Secondly, mute your microphone when you're not speaking. We don't want um, any background noise to interfere with someone else's experience. Um, and have your talking piece ready. Um, we're not going to need it for the activity, but we will use it for the circle. 
be present as possible. If that means taking a deep breath in and taking um, an exhale, do that. Um, and then also please maintain integrity in the process. Um, and then lastly, show up as yourself and not as your title. And if anything happens, we'll give you the benefit of the doubt. All righty. So panelists, if you could please all turn your cameras off. We are going to do an activity called cameras on, cameras off. So um, everyone turn your cameras off and I will say a couple of statements. And if the statements apply to you, turn your camera on. The first statement, turn your camera on if you feel excited about something in the last month. All right, turn your cameras off. Turn your cameras on if you watch Tiger King during the pandemic. Hey, no judgment, no judgment. <laughs> it was a good documentary. All right, turn your cameras off. Turn your cameras on if you took up a new hobby during the quarantine. All right. Oh, okay. Hi, Emmanuel. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what hobby, uh, what new hobby did you pick up? Um, so, um, previously, I didn't like spending much time watching movies, but uh, during the lockdown, um, I gave it because there was so much time to stay with kids and the family and um, I started enjoying it and it's actually now become a habit. Thank you for sharing, Emmanuel. All right, the next statement says, turn your cameras on if you reconnected with an old friend or relative during the pandemic. Who would have thought something uh, bad could make us do something so great. <laughs> All righty, turn your cameras off. This is one of my favorite ones. Um, so turn your cameras on if you are an American Ninja Warrior. <laughs> you just want to see if I'm paying attention, don't you? <laughs> All right, thank you, Mark. Turn your cameras off. Turn your camera on if you celebrated your birthday during the quarantine. All right, no birthdays, okay. Turn your camera on if you built something this summer. Mamta, you wanna tell us what did you build? You're on mute. Um, sure. I facilitated building. Um, we, my students came together to make uh, students for COVID. And um, so I helped facilitate uh, making and the coming together of that organization. Thank you for sharing. All righty. The next statement is turn your camera on if you are scared about what the future can look like. All right. Turn your camera on. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I missed it. Uh, turn your camera on if your pet helps you feel better during the quarantine. Those snuggles are real. <laughs> All right, turn your camera off. Turn your camera on if you are passionate about your current career path. All right, I'm glad. Turn your cameras off. Turn your camera on if someone you loved suffered directly from COVID-19. Turn your cameras off. Turn your cameras on if you sing in the shower. 
we love those concerts. I'll tell you that. <laughs> we spend like 10 more minutes just singing. It's perfectly fine. All righty. Um, Udoro, do you want to share with us what is a, a go-to song that you sing in the shower? Oh, wow. Um, if, it's not, if it's not anything by NDRE, um, uh, Jonathan McReynolds' uh, Make Room is, has been my, my song of just, yes, where I am in my life right now. So, yes. NDRE or Jonathan Mc, Mc, McReynolds? All right. Monta, do you want to share one of your songs that you sing in the shower? You're on mute. Mine's all in Hindi um, that I sing in the shower. And there's my go-to song is from a movie from 1980. Uh, it's, the movie's name is Hero. And Anita's rolling her eyes right now. Um, so... Thank you for sharing. Turn your cameras off. All righty, the next statement. We only have a few more statements left. Turn your camera on if you created a TikTok account while in quarantine. All right. Turn your cameras off. Turn your camera on if you feel valued in your profession. All right, turn your cameras off. Turn your cameras on if you FaceTime, Zoom, Skyped, or at, uh, at least once a day with a friend or a family member. All right, turn your cameras off. Turn your cameras on if you attended a protest this summer. All right, turn your cameras off. Turn your cameras on if you feel stressed out a lot. All right, whoever is, is not stressed out, please teach us your ways. We need tips here. <laughs> we need some more meditation, something else. All right, turn your cameras off. Turn your cameras on if you're excited about challenges ahead this year. All right, so you can keep your cameras on now. That was the last statement that I have for you guys. Thank you so much for participating and being vulnerable. Um, we're now going to move into getting closer to our um, circle, but before that, I do want to give a brief um, summary about the Hippocratic Oath and my perspective of what it means. So to me, the Hippocratic Oath says, you'll share your knowledge with others who, are, who also practice medicine because you are a team. Not only will you be sharing your knowledge, but when you don't know something, you'll ask for others' help in order to help the patient. You have the power to help someone's life or take it away, but you're not God. And you must remember that you are not treating an illness, but a person. And lastly, you'll stay true to this oath and enjoy helping others. So I'm not targeting this at anyone, nor the panelists, or nor, nor the participants. This is just my summary of what the Hippocratic Oath and my perspective of it. Some things to keep in mind before we move very, very shortly into our circle. Like I mentioned, please have your camera on uh, this specifically to the panelists. Mute your microphone when you're not speaking. Um, have your talking piece ready as we will be using it. Please be present. Um, and then show up as yourself and not as, as your title and be respectful of others' opinions or thoughts. That being said, I will start our circle now. Um, and I will... Uh, start with an opening quote. The opening quote says, I will remember that I do not treat a fever chart, a cancerous growth, but a sick human being whose illness may affect a person's life and economic stability. Um, this is a more 
modern version of the Hippocratic Oath written by uh, a woman named Lasagna in 1964. Um, we are now going to do a circle. I will be putting everyone's name um, in the chat feature. So this is more for the panelists. So please open your chat so you can see the order in which you'll be speaking. All right, so you should have uh, received the order in which we will be speaking. Um, so that being said, the first question is, how do you relate? Actually, let me backtrack. Um, we are going to do a first round. In this first round, I want you to say your name and then present your talking piece. Um, so I can go first. Uh, my name is Leslie. My talking piece, um, it's a little bit bigger than what I expected. It's this little cute teddy bear. I've had this since I was like six or eight years old. My parents gave it to me, so it holds a lot of meaning to me. Um, and I'll pass my talking piece to Mamta. Uh, my name's Mamta, and this is my talking piece. My talking piece is a necklace, um, and my necklace has um, my mother's uh, thumbprint on it uh, from when she passed away. And I used to call her Guria, which means doll. And so that's, um, I have that on the back of it. It says Mady Guria, which means my doll. And so I'm going to pass my talking piece on to Mark. My, <clears throat> my name is Mark, and uh, my talking piece is this little carved walnut that's carved into the shape of a cat. <clears throat> it's uh, it's uh, something I got in uh, some travels about five years ago and just sort of has special meaning to me from that. And I'm passing on to uh, Emmanuel. Emmanuel, you're on mute. He is. My name is Emmanuel. Um, my talking piece is is uh, clear as clearly through the uh, through the bottle, and um, uh, it's just keeping a clean hand, heart and uh, clean thoughts all the time. I pass my talking piece to Doro. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, my talking piece is honestly, it's a rock that one of my children painted and on here it says the word smile. And so that is the talking piece I will be using. And I pass to Kwali or? Kali. Kali, yes. thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm Kali and I'm sorry I'm post call. I was up last night and uh, so I might be a little <laughs> on the slow side. My talking piece is gonna be this pen. Um, it is a pen that uh, we got for a company that we started last year, um, teaching trauma and surgical skills to um, advanced practice providers, nurse oh, practice practitioners and PAs. So Basketball. it's always with me because I have a gazillion of them, so. <laughs> Oh, All righty, thank you guys for introducing yourselves a little bit and your talking piece. The first round says, um, I'll read the opening quote again. I'll remember, this is opening quote. I'll remember that I do not treat a fever chart, a cancerous growth, but a sick human being whose illness may affect the person's life and economic stability. So uh, the question is, how do you relate to the opening quote? Mamta, take it away. Uh, 
Um, I think that it makes me feel like I have to um, really understand on certain patients why sometimes their families outside of quarantine aren't there to be with them. Um, and I had a patient once whose niece did not want to have her 90 year old grand, like aunt um, cared for for an obstruction because she was unable to um, take care of her or and didn't have funding to deal with her and it was a really weird position for me to be in um, because she had medical power of attorney and stuff. Um, and for me, it always puts me in a weird position, that quote, because there are times that when you're just going and you're in surgeon mode and you're just going and going and going, um, I'll miss like, my resident feeling vulnerable during an ED thoracotomy. I had a second year who did an ED thoracotomy with me and they're always so excited about doing a procedure like that, that I missed him needing me to debrief with him immediately versus later in the day. Um, and yeah, that's how I relate to it. Maybe not perfectly, but that's how that affects me. I pass my uh, talking piece to Emmanuel. Uh, sorry, Leslie, can you come again? I was struggling to hear the, the question initially. Yeah, so the question says, how do you relate to the opening quote? What was the opening quote? The opening quote is, I will remember that I do not treat a fever chart, a cancerous growth, but a sick human being whose illness may affect the person's family and economic stability. Right. So um, the way I relate with it is um, uh, in, in day to day uh, practice, I see uh, several kids that their families simply cannot afford. Uh, to pay the cost of care uh, and several times when I'm faced with a situation where the parents decide where because they can't afford the cost of care they are going home and I know for that condition that's like a death sentence and I'm then torn between what do I do and many times uh, I look around and the nurses and the trainees, everybody's waiting. What is he going to do or say? And, um, it, and it's really a difficult uh, decision. And sometimes we get, I get it wrong. Sometimes I get it right. Uh, but, but I think the main challenge is that it, it's a very difficult time. And I know I take wrong decisions about those kind of things. So I pass uh, on to Kali. Oh, thank you. Um, so the way I relate to it is um, in relation to what is going on right now. I think um, we're in the middle of a pandemic. A lot of our patients have you know, um, lost their jobs. Um, we are uh, dealing with um, a lot of our patients getting sick um, and public health, you know, being mismanaged on a global scale. And so when, when we as physicians take to, you know, social media and other outlets and publish and talk about um, standing up for our patients' um, uh, rights and advocating for 
uh, public health policies advocating for um, fighting against systemic racism, um, which affects patients' health care, um, you know, their socioeconomic status. Uh, we get the pushback that as physicians, you know, you do your job, right? Um, treat the fever, <laughs> treat the cancerous mass. Um, so I, I think this is a this is an important you know conversation for us to have on a much bigger scale, and not just you know physician to patient, but um, a, a healthcare system to the, the 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 public as far as you know where do we stand when it comes to public health issues and you know pandemics, um, other um, systemic issues that affect our patients um, directly and indirectly. I pass it on to Mark. I, I'm I'm sorry. I think I. Um, I called, I got called earlier. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, I love this uh, rephrasing of the uh, Hippocratic Oath. Um, you know, there's a presupposition in, at least in, in many countries, uh, that uh, presupposition towards cure at all costs. Um, I've got to treat you no matter what. Uh, and that supposition is so deep that honestly, somebody would ask me, you know, how much is this MRI going to cost? I don't actually know the answer to that question. And it's such a complex system here in the U.S. that the answer to that question for patient A is going to be different than the answer to that question for patient B because of insurances, et cetera. So I love the fact that this takes into account the, 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 the tension that um, every patient implicitly or explicitly has to deal with of do I subject myself to this treatment, which may end up bankrupting me, um, or do I choose, as Emmanuel was saying, do I choose to forego this treatment uh, for the benefit of, you know, keeping my family solvent, um, you know, uh, even, even if, as Emmanuel says, even if it's a death sentence for me. Uh, this is a tension that we rarely talk about, uh, so I'm really excited that this is how we're, we're opening the circle, and I will pass on to Eudoro. Thank you, Mark. Um, so for me, I, I, I come from a place where I have been a patient. I, um, I have had my, all three of my children in a hospital. Um, I have seen my youngest child and my oldest um, undergo surgery for various reasons. Um, and number of uh, what, how that quote relates to me is being a mother um, of a child who is seeking care. Um, honestly, my, yes, while my, my, my faith and my trust in, and I do believe in God, I do believe in, in, in clearly a creator who is way bigger than me, bigger than um, all of us, um, while my faith and my trust definitely remains there, I look at this individual in my face who stands before me, who will be, um, hmm, who will be cutting my child open, who will be placing my child underneath whatever anesthesia, whatever. Um, and so, really, that's that's where that's where this this um, quote you you know relates to me in that my faith and my trust is you better do right by my child. Um, you better do right by me. I also have um, siblings. I think about my, my sister right now. I think about just a number of people who I know who have been um, patients and who I believe have seen um, and, it ha and have experienced neglect. Um, so for me, it really is... Um, do you really stand by what it is that when you stand before me in that office, in that room, do you really stand by uh, what that oath is? And so that's for me how I, I show up. So that's how that quote, you know, relates to me. Thank you. And I pass to, um, back to Leslie. All right. Thank you everyone for sharing and participating and being vulnerable. Um, just a quick reminder that this is, a circle that could be uncomfortable and it is okay. Um, our motto here at Ray is that you need to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. Um, so please express yourselves, become vulnerable, feel that uncomfortableness, it's okay. Um, so now we're going to move on to the second question. Uh, so when in history do you believe the oath has been undone? Not just the opening 
quote referencing but the whole oath as it's like as its own when in history do you believe the oath has been undone um and please look at the uh, chat i um i put the order of how we are going to be speaking so it's first mamta then it's going to be emmanuel followed by emmanuel is going to be udoro mark and then Kali, hopefully I said that right. Okay, yes. <laughs> um, and go ahead and take it away, Mamta. When has the oath been undone? I think that the oath is undone constantly. I think that people mean well, but I don't think that, um, that because of our biases, because we're human, that we can be completely equal, no matter how hard we try. I mean, I've, I've shared my first realization of feeling something like a bias. Um, when I was growing up, um, my first time ever, like I wasn't growing up as an Im immigrant only child, like we were, I was never allowed to watch any TV shows with black people, okay, except the Cosby show, okay, oh, go figure, um, and my mom was, a, you know, she, she was, she used to teach uh, in community college, and I used to go with her to help set up her cat labs, and I still remember um, when I went the first time and there was these three tall black guys walking towards me, my heart started racing and I recognized, I was like, wait a minute, what just happened? And I remember that to date. And there's no reason for me to have felt anything weird except that I was not allowed to watch something like that right or watch anything with black people and, Ooh, why can't I watch anything with black people right and I mean that all went away because I mean I went to Ailey Hastings uh, uh, for high school <laughs> right um, but it's a very interesting phenomenon and so when we have different ways that we're raised different things that are ingrained into us um, and in the trauma bay, Kali, right? Like you can, I'm sure you guys can relate to this. You know that, you know, someone was a drunk driver and someone was the victim. Like you don't want to, it's not something that's necessary for you to know. You don't need to know what happened. You just have, you have two patients who had a mechanism and you know, that's all you need to know. You don't need to know what happened. Ooh, what happened at the scene? Like, that's not necessary information for you because it creates bias, right? There's things you need to know and, you know, there's things you don't. And the reasons that we don't need to know those things are because we are human. Um, and I, I think that the oath is undone all the time. I never saw that women didn't get more pain medication or get as much pain medication till I had like actually took off these rose colored glasses and saw patients in the ICU like just not getting pain medication when they were extubated. It's, we do it all the time and it's, it's something that if you recognize you can do something about but without taking that first step of admitting something it's almost like an like um uh, in aa the addiction right like you have to you have to accept it to make any kind of changes to it um i don't know if that makes sense or not 
Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna pass mine talking to Emmanuel. Uh, thank you, Mam Tan. Um, so for me, I think that um, the the oath has been undone when I don't treat the um, the people I have some advantage uh, over if I don't treat them well. And and a a common thing that I have to deal with all the time is when I treat uh, residents um in a way that is not right because i'm under pressure or because i'm expecting one resident to be exactly like another resident who is very good and many times i forget that look every individual is different every individual has different ways of learning but somehow under pressure sometimes especially when things are going wrong especially in uh, in the operating room or after surgery and things are simply not going the way they should. And sometimes um, I, I take it out on the resident who, who is supposedly the weaker uh, person and, um, uh, and I see when I see the expression on his or her face and I always suddenly realize, oh, look, this is not right. And I try to correct it. But again, we are human. It still happens from time to time. And I try to find a way to um, rectify that by uh, getting together with the resident one-on-one -on -one after at a different relaxed uh, time. Uh, but but it's, it's difficult. And I think as humans, um, we are faced with situations all the time, particularly when things are not going well for us or when we are under pressure. I think those are the times that some of our inner uh, kind of um, uh, the bad part of us, those are some of the times that they begin uh, to come out. Uh, and it's something that I keep trying to work on all the time, but I don't think I've succeeded. Uh, but again, I accept that I'm human and I can make mistakes and errors. But yeah, so I pass um, on to Doro. So um, for the question, as far as a time in, in, in history, for me, I tend to bring up, uh, or I tend to think about, um, our, our mental health sector, right? And so how so many times in, especially when I think about in this country, um, so many people have just been shunned, <clears throat> just stashed away in some hospital somewhere and only to like, wait, whatever happened to so-and-so? Oh, they're, they, they went crazy or they're hysterical or, um, and so it, where you almost, again, you don't, you don't see the human being. Right. And so um, for me, that's that's what I've spent time and even like I got to be on the on the East Coast a bit. And so even remembering from stuff that I studied when I was when I was in school, there were certain certain hospitals that were opened up really to um, to, to, to put people if they couldn't control their behaviors or they had. Um, uh, maybe they 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 saw things, or again, family members just didn't know how to deal. They could they could stash their their family member away, and it was pretty much that was pretty much it. And so, um, again, not seeing the human being, um, and only seeing the um, the the ailment, and that's it. Um, I I find that to be a problem, and and I know that's that's throughout, um, you know. Uh, history. So, for for one thing, I would say in, in the United in the United States, um, when they're just really trying to figure out mental health and how to work with it, they instead just stashed people away. And I pass to Mark. Thank you, Doro. Um, <clears throat> there's a line in the 
in the oath it says something on the order of um, I will uh, not do harm or injustice to my patients. And, you know, we know the oath is first do no harm, um, but the or injustice part, um, I think, is where we often fall down as, as clinicians. I, forget, I think it may have been Kali who said the idea that we need to sort of stay in our lane um, and, and do our, you know, treat our fever chart um, as opposed to recognizing and, and treating uh, the injustice, uh, which has both health effects and to get back to our first question, economic effects on the patients that we, that we treat. Uh, there's a, a quote that Key Park shared with me yesterday from uh, Rudolf Virchow that says, medicine is a social science and politics is nothing more than medicine on a large scale. Uh, so this idea that we are, we, we take an oath to be more than just physicians in the traditional sense of being physicians, but physicians in a social and justice sense as well. And I will pass on to Kali. Oh, thank you, Mark. So, you know, I believe uh, I heard, you know, when in history um, the oath was, was undone. And I think, you know, history is very important um, as we got the first introduction of, you know, this Gila circle, um, the story of Henrietta, Henrietta Lacks. And, you know, the history of medicine when it comes to you know um, treating our um, black and indigenous and Hispanic patients and other um, people of color, it's not great, right? And the fact that we're not taught this in medical school, in residency, is very detrimental. Um, and so, in in studying up on this history on my own, um, one of the things that um, I, I think we do a disservice um, because when you don't know history, we repeat it and we are continuing to repeat it is um, how um, enslaved people were treated. Physicians were the people on the front line having clinics where they evaluated um, enslaved people and basically made a lot of money off of um, treating them, getting them better so they can go and do more work and get more abused, right? There was an entire career where people made money off of, you know, treating people so they could be enslaved, so they could be mistreated, right? There's a, um, there's a gyne um, gynecologist, uh, Marion Simmons, uh, Marion Sims, who practiced his uh, surgical skills on enslaved women, perfected his skills, and then moved to New York to practice his new, newly found skills on white women under anesthesia, right? So one of the things, you know, when we talk about implicit bias and when we talk about, um, you know, yes, we're all, um, we're all, let me give you one second, I'm sorry. I'm homeschooling a lot of kids. Um, so when we talk about when we talk about implicit bias, you know, we're barely scratching the surface, right? We don't know the history under which our textbooks were written and based on. Um, when we don't give, you know, women and not enough pain medications, and when we have, uh, there's a survey that said I think it was at least I, I believe 40 to 50 percent. Um, of medical students believe that black people do not feel pain, that their skin is thicker and do not, and they do not feel pain. Therefore, they do not get more pain medications. They do not get enough pain medications, right? So racism and mistreatment and injustice is engraved in our curriculum, right? So unless we learn that history, unless we find out and, and trace back where in our history, where in our medical curriculum, we abandoned that oath a long time ago, right? It's not what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. I think we're all human beings and we all, you know, there are days when we do great work, there are days when we fall short. But we have a medical system that was never designed for people to be treated equally. So I feel like that's an excellent question. And looking back at, how the medical system, it, and, and it's not just the U.S., it's not just isolated to the U.S., it's, it's, it's global. There are, there are indigenous people that are mistreated, 
So unless we go back and figure out where have we abandoned that oath and where did we start treating people unjustly or unfairly, I think we're far, you know, very far away from, from having a more um, fruitful discussion on equity. And I pass back on to Leslie. Thank you, Kali, and please don't apologize. We understand that you are homeschooling, uh, but thank you anyways. Um, we are going to move to our last question. Uh, we are running a little bit out of time, but the last question says, what do you desire for people to take away from this time together? And I will be posting again the name of the order in which we are speaking. There you go. Um, so again, what do you desire people to take away from this time together? Manta, take it away. Yeah, I, taking in the question. Um, I think that the biggest thing, the biggest thing, oy, the most important thing from being able to show others restorative justice outside of the small number of people that I know in trauma and, you know, other groups of like pockets of physicians that know about restorative justice circles is that this is a way to be present and to hear each other and to bring patients, to bring physicians. And when you actively listen and you decide to make yourself vulnerable to each other, that's when you're able to make change, like real change, not the fake kind of bs -y change, but like real change. Um, and I, I mean, I, I, I've, I've said this a couple of times, there is not really a safe space, right? But this is as, honest as I think a lot of us are being like we're talking about you know I, when I've noticed about in the ICU about not giving pain medication till I like I was like oh my god I'm doing it right and ta everyone's talking about like things that they've noticed right whether it is as a patient or a teacher or a practitioner and we all kind of came together to do this. And, and I think that this is as raw as we can be. And if we can grieve the fact that we're not perfect, okay, and we can be angry at ourselves, and we can reflect on our conversation, right? And take something away from it. Because if you know what your bias is, right? I know exactly what my bias is, right? And so I make sure that if I have a bias to a certain group of people, that I am extra careful, right? And that's how I try to be cognizant of, you know, how I practice and how I do medicine. And so if you don't know there's a problem, you can't, you, you can't do anything about it. And, you know, someone, someone very close to me told me, all you see is black and white now. All you see is color. And I said, that's right. Because like, that's all there is to see is colors, right? When there was a point where I, you know, I didn't notice anything. But now I do, and I see the inequity, and it, it's insane when I see the, the gender inequity, the racial inequity, the, you know, the, the political inequity of everything, and it's crazy. So I hope that this is a way for, once this tr the trainings happen, that people are able to use this as a way to 
it's not just for kids who are going to go to jail, you know, it's a way for all of us to kind of bring together our points of view and to heal, right? And to heal, you know, when I was talking to Kali about this, she, you know, her perspective is so cool, right? Which she's got to talk about, I hope, right? You have to, because um, I'm like not talking about it because I'm like, oh, she's going to talk about it, right? And we, we have to be able to make change and to make change, we have to like just be transformative and like, just like break boundaries and to do that, aim high. If we can bring surgeons together and you know, we can talk about it and we can change our points of view, oh, right? Like let's think about surgeons, right? Then, you know, I think we can break down a lot of access to health and education and if we can do that then hopefully our patients and you know for me like my trauma patients won't die <laughs> there'll be less gun violence there will be less maternal mortality um and you know that's the long term but i hope people see a way for us to actually make implicit bias training work So I'm going to pass my talking piece to Emmanuel. Uh, thank you, Mamta. Uh, so for me, I, I think that um, uh, it's one of the things um, I, I, I realize and recognize is that, yes, it's difficult to talk about um, difficult issues and difficulties that appear a little bit complex that don't seem to have an immediate solution that everybody thinks so differently about. But I think an important takeaway is the fact that we, we need to find it in our hearts and in our minds to feel comfortable um, uh, and relaxed to talk about the difficult issues that we face every day and some of the things that we struggle with all the time and to acknowledge where we have gone wrong and find a way to, to rectify that. Um, it's not going to happen overnight. Uh, when Leslie asked the first uh, question and as Mamta was speaking and I knew it was going to maybe come to me, I was like, oh, okay this is going to be a very difficult time and tense time. But as we started talking, I started feeling more and more comfortable and more and more relaxed and more and more, uh, and more open. And, and I think that as humans, that's just the reality. We can be emotional about things uh, and try to uh, because the reality is if we don't talk about things, uh, then everybody is bottling everything down. And then one day everybody is just going to blow up. Sometimes after just a little provocation, because we bottled down so many things at the time. I remember when I was a junior resident, uh, a, a, an intern, and one of the uh, attendants called me one day and he said, Emmanuel, you... You are too calm. You don't, you don't seem to have any emotions. All that we are doing to you as an intern, you are not complaining, you are not talking, and I'm dying inside. <laughs> you know, and so when he said that to me, I said, oh, okay. So really, I, I have to show what I feel. And after about when I was finishing that rotation, uh, and as I took my papers to him to sign, he said to me, you know, you've changed a lot. I've seen you through while you were in medical school. I've seen you the last three months and so much has changed. Now you come to me and complain, oh, I didn't sleep last night. You can't say this to me today. You can't, I can't do this. So, and that was because he, he opened up and told me what he felt about me. And I also realized, look, I needed to show my emotions to talk about whenever I don't feel happy, whenever I feel badly, treated, and I tell you in the, in the medical world, especially in the surgical world, 
we do horrible things to our trainees and residents all the time. Uh, and um, so, so I think for me, the biggest takeaway is finding it in our hearts and minds to feel comfortable gen and genuinely, openly talk about these things. Uh, I pass on to Doro. Uh, what do I hope you take away from this time is, I mean, I feel like everyone has pretty much hit it. Um, um, I think about self-reflection, um, making sure you take that, take that time, um, to just, yes, take a step back and, and, um, almost have like a bird's eye view of, of yourself and what you thought, um, how you felt. Um, I also think about um, I'm hoping we or well, I or we can walk away um, again listening Mamta, you you totally hit it you know um, true listening is for me once again seeing the individual for who they are um, seeing you know that's someone's child right there um that's someone's parent um uh just yeah truly truly um not repeating things that have already been done Kali you 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 name some things and, and I feel like we we all have um let let's not have a repeat please like this is like it's just it's that thing for me where where um oh well we've we've always done it like this it doesn't work for me so how about you you know you you change that when it comes to me um because again when you when you know when we when we operate like that i do believe that's where we will then be able to honor the humanity we then will be able to, um, as we move, how do I show up? How do I show up at work? How do I show up when I go to the store? How do I show up when I'm driving in my car? Which I feel like for me, um, some horrible uh, uh, words tend to come to my mind when I drive, but, but it does challenge me, right? And so it, 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 ex from, it, it extends beyond, beyond our roles, it extends beyond our, our our workplace is truly how do you operate in the life that you you have, and so if you can if you wake up with that, that with that mindset, you will be a little bit more mindful how you treat the people that you live with. You'll be a little bit more mindful of how you show up to work. You'll be a little bit more mindful, um, and so that's that's my that's my hope hope for us that we are that we reflect. Introspection is is huge, and um, Let's let's not repeat what's what's been done. Um, yeah. So again, thank you for this time, and I pass to Mark. Thank you, Eudora. Um, but I've, what's going on in my head is is kind of inchoate, not fully formed. So uh, so bear with me for a second. Um, first of all, as surgeons, we're not used to this. Right. As surgeons, we act um, and stop the bleeding afterwards. Uh, and 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 it is that's not a I mean it's not a bad thing. It's what we have to do when we're in the middle of the operating room. It's a skill that that you know uh, comes more or less naturally uh, to some or the other of us, but eventually it's something that we all have to kind of learn how to do. Uh, the problem I think goes to what Eudora was just saying is that uh, is that action quick action to fix the problem um, is going to simp is going to come from positions of sort of our current our own current implicit biases uh, and so to stop and to think and to talk and to listen um, you know at some point action does have to happen but I, I, I really hope that what comes out of this is the idea that um, that uh, we're not going to undo, you know, centuries of uh, of like 
literally constructed and legally constructed inequity um, by December. Um, and, and not just by December, but by doing the same things that we've done uh, before. Uh, it strikes me often when I read stories of, of some of these things, uh, you know, um, Henrietta Lacks, uh, there's a question in the Q&A about the Tuskegee experiment. Uh, you know, as hard as it is for us to think about this, the, the likelihood is the vast majority of people involved in doing these things didn't think they were doing anything wrong. They came from their own sort of, their own backgrounds, their own structures, their own histories. Uh, and we are not immune to that. Uh, so if we decide to do something, uh, we collectively, you know, in 2020, uh, it's going to be built on our own histories as well. So I think that's what I really hope comes out of this is that we, um, yeah, the, who was it? And if we had a, for the panel for the participants, we had a prep call yesterday and somebody in the prep call said the, something, there was a quote that said something like the, the, the tools of the master are not going to dismantle the um, structures that the master built. And, and I, that resonated with me. It's kind of been bouncing around in my head all day. Uh, so that, uh, that it, that's exactly what I hope comes out of this is, is that we don't dive into this like surgeons, but we dive into this um, in exactly the way that, that uh, has started here. And I will pass on to Kali. Thank you, Mark. Um, so I think what Mumta was referring to is um, my personal <laughs> experience um, in surgery. So um, as you can see, I'm a Muslim. I'm from Somalia, so I grew up there. Um, came to the U.S. after the Civil War. Um, so I'm practicing uh, Muslim. Um, I've always been interested in surgery and um, have always wanted to, you know, to, to operate. So my entire experience from the time I expressed, you know, interest in surgery to the, to the time where I graduated and I was a practicing surgeon, the answer has always been no. Right. That has, the answer has always been no. You are not a typical surgeon. You are not. It, it, this is not meant for you. Um, so I, you know, kept my head down and did the work. And then when I got into residency, um, my intern year, I started having kids. And so I had, um, and in a program that has never had um, um, a resident give birth during training. Um, so there was no maternity leave policy. And so the answer I was given um, was that I should quit, that I should leave the program because, you know, it's never been done. It'll never be done. Um, so as the most junior resident to get pregnant with no paternity leave policy, I had to kind of, you know, work through the system to figure out, okay, I'm here. I'm not going to go anywhere until I physically can't be here. How do we fix the system? So we ended up borrowing a, a maternity leave policy from our ob department and adapted it into our policy. Um, luckily, I had two, two chief residents who were pregnant around the same time who kind of helped with that. So after that, I got pregnant again my second year, my fourth year, my chief year, I had twins. And then I finished and then I came back as a fellow to do my critical care fellowship and I had my sixth baby at the time. And as I'm doing this and I'm, you know, guys, can you keep it down, please? And so as I am doing this and I am, you know, um, taking good care of my patients, getting um, um, along well with my, you know, uh, fellow residents and nurses and, you know, and nothing to indicate that I'm, you know, a bad physician. The answer has always been, this is not meant for you. You should quit. Right. And so even after I had finished and I passed my boards and I did everything um, as a practicing physician, a fellow surgeon would, would tell me, who are you to tell us how to operate and how to, how to do surgery, right? So my entire being, my entire persona was, was, was deemed unacceptable in this field. So, and, you know, I had a lot of support thing that I had a lot of, you know, family, um, husband. And so one of the things that I do right now is I speak about these experiences and I talk to these experiences to say, you know, we have a system that was never designed for many of us, right? We say diversity and inclusion. Um, we say, you know, we, um, we, um, have equity, but my experience, my direct experience has been the opposite. Right. I had family members who, you know, I go to the uh, um, hospital with and when I am quiet and I don't say anything, they get treated 
terribly. They get talked down to, they get inappropriate diagnoses. But as soon as I start speaking up and I start using medical lingo, all of a sudden everybody is on good behavior and now they're doing the right thing. So I use that experience to empower the Somali community um, to, you know, um, to teach them how to advocate for themselves and how to um, improve, you know, um, their health literacy. So one of the things that I would like, you know, for people to get out of this is the power of the individual. Right? I don't think we emphasize that as enough and we say this is a huge problem. Nobody can take, you know, can, 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 can take it on. I understand. But if we empower individuals and we have a collective action of individuals who are empowered and who are capable, like how, like look at the like uh, millennial generation right now with their use of social media and how impactful they are, right? It's multiple individuals coming together to fight you know, with, uh, for one cause. Guys, can you please, I, five more minutes, five more minutes, I apologize. So, so that is one thing I would like for this um, to be, you know, in, in addition to what everybody said about speaking up, about you know, sharing your feelings, sharing your experiences. Um, you sharing your story and your experience can power the next, the next person to say, you know what, I can do that. I can, I can tell, and, and what I tell my mentees is, you know, there are some sacrifices that you'll have to, you know, that you'll have to make. Not every person, not, you know, not every person is going to be, you know, a cheerleader and, and not everybody is going to be supportive, right? The person who's being, you know, uh, an impediment to you, use that as, as fuel to fire you to say, you know what, I'm going to get there. I'm going to make it. And when I make it, I'm going to fight for the other people who are voiceless, the other people in my community who have no idea. So, and I really like the idea of, you know, using restorative justice for us to deal with the fact that we all have implicit bias. But the other, um, the other people that I would also like for us to focus on is the people who are being impacted by um, the health disparities. You know, how do we use restorative justice for them to say, okay, how do we empower communities who have been, um, uh, who have suffered a lot of injustices to say, you know, how do you, how, how do we empower them to speak up and say, you know what, no more. You know, we need better care. We need better treatment. And I'll pass it back on to Leslie. All righty. Thank you guys for, uh, oh. I see your hand. <laughs> Go ahead and share before we close the circle. Because like when Kali and I were talking and she was like, patients get labeled as non-compliant and it's not that they're non-compliant. It's that they've been victims of racism and there's no trust. And when there's no trust, how do you move past that? And I've never felt that before in my life because of my skin tone. And I felt that the last time I was on service. My patients didn't trust me with everything that was going on in the city of Chicago. And it was crazy. I told you guys about it. I, I didn't understand what was happening. And it was crazy. And so I think to be able to have healing like you used, this is totally your idea, right? Of healing communities. Oh my God. Empowering communities to be able to you know, taking disenfranchised communities and empowering them to like have a say in their healthcare would be amazing. And, and I think it would, it would revolutionize what, what we're, we're trying to stand for. And it would take us as surgeons and doctors out of the picture because it's not about us. never been about us and that was the point that Kali made that like just like grounded me and I just I gotta give her props and make sure that 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 is like stated 
So. Alrighty, thank you everyone for sharing and being vulnerable and accepting to be in this place. Um, I want to say Eudoro, Mark, Mamta, Kali, Emmanuel, you are seen and you are heard. And with that being said, I am going to close the circle. The closing quote for the circle is, if you don't sacrifice for what you want, what you want becomes the sacrifice. And that's by Jay Shetty. And with that being said, thank you guys for uh, being in here in the circle with me and letting me be part of this. Um, Dr. Vadra, I'll pass it back to you. Hello, everyone. I just, I had one meta comment. First of all, thank you. I mean, that was really mind blowing. My mind was all over the place. Um, if this is Kali post call, I don't want to know what it's like pre call. That's all I have to say. Actually, I do want to know. I'll take that back. Um, but every one of you, you know, um, make such good points. I just want to make a meta reflection on the circle process, particularly virtual circles, the chat feature. Um, and we're learning as we go, but I do want to name that um, this has happened in other trainings. Sometimes things occur in circle that can actually create harm. And I just want to point out a comment that was made in the chat. It was a joke about um, the pronoun usage um, and kind of like, I couldn't tell, like kind of making, basically it, it comes off as, and I don't know the intent of making light of pronouns. And this is actually the exact example of what we're trying to combat in this webinar is we're trying to combat oppression and create liberation and create dignity for all people. And we know trans patients are, are, have many health disparities and particularly trans people of color. And when we look at trans people of color being murdered, it just feels like a pronoun. However, if you were called out of your name every day, if I identify as she and her, and everyone call me he and every day, that is a constant microaggression. So even though, okay, you think everyone should know I'm a she and a her, we do that to model that we see you as what you identify as. And it troubles me that if that is a bias that emerged in the chat, it's probably not the only one. I myself have, um, have uh, perpetuated transphobia at some point for a lack of understanding. Um, but having trans students, trans friends, um, this is not a canceling moment. We were trying to figure, do you keep that person in the webinar? Do you kick them out? Restorative justice is about naming the harm. Like Kali said, restorative justice is not for the people who oppressed to say, this is what I'm gonna do to repair, it's the people who are harmed. So I wanna name that, not as someone who identifies as trans, but as a harm that came out and it's just a meta reflection and not to shame anyone, but it's an issue that needs to be raised for all people, but particularly medical professionals. And with that, I'll just pass it on to you all to continue the um, TV. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Wadva, for mentioning um, the harm that um, occurred and addressing it. Uh, it was very important to do that. And I want to thank everyone who participated in the circle. I also um, found it very inspiring, very empowering to see um, faculty, surgeons, um, members of Ray who are specialized in this talk in such an open and honest way. Um, I think it, it was an incredible uh, and educational experience for everyone who was watching. Um, Leslie, I believe you have some debriefing before uh, we go into any other Q&A that we have from the uh, attendees. So I will pass on to you for any debriefing that you have from the circle. Um, thank you. Um, and with that being said, uh, so we are going to debrief a little bit. Um, so this is more for the, uh, the panelists, so how did, how was it to be part of a circle? How was your experience? Um, and we can go in the same order as we had when, uh, with, the, <laughs> all right, we can change it up. Like, we could change it up. Uh, uh, just for the sake of let's go backwards. Okay, we can do backwards. All righty. Um, Kali, <laughs> they caught you off guard. Caught me off guard. Okay, so I think it was a 
pretty interesting. And because we started out so broad, I think we could, we, we you know, hit a, a multiple different um, uh, things. Um, the one feedback that I would um, have is, you know, um, my, my impression of it initially was, you know, implicit bias and um, how we use restorative justice in dealing with implicit bias. Um, and the questions I thought were just a little um, broad and, and um, but, but I think as a starting point, I don't know if, this, if these circles are things that are continuous and happen multiple times with the same group. Um, if that's the case, then I think starting off broad and then niching down um, is, 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 is good. But I thought this was a very productive um, conversation. So thank you guys. Thank you, Kali. Um, and since we are going backwards, Mark, you are the lucky one. Uh, thank you, Leslie. Um, I don't have a lot more to add from what Kali said. Uh, uh, I, I think like Emmanuel said, I was a little nervous. wasn't really sure what to expect coming into this. Um, I think the conversation just, what, what, I, what I love most about this is that everybody answered the question in a slightly different way. Everybody's understanding of the question was slightly different and in doing so we ended up getting at all sorts of different angles on this that any one-on-one -on -one conversation may not may not have had um, I agree with Kali that uh, that you know it, it does feel like this and I know you all have plans for uh, more training after this but it does feel like this is the start of a conversation rather than kind of the wrap-up of a of a conversation and back to you Leslie Alrighty, thank you, Mark, for sharing. We are now going to do uh, Udoro. It's your turn. I would say, I mean, I, I I honestly enjoyed it. I've I've never been in in such a beautiful room of 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 people who are y'all are in a totally different realm of of profession than I am. Um, but this was it, it was. I feel I feel like. Um, just being able to to connect to you all and be able to listen and um, to actually live out what what I believe we all need to be able to do. Um, and so I, I enjoyed it. I actually have a lot of questions, but I think we just need to save for you know a time when we could be off of this. Um, but yes, thank you, thank you, Kali, thank you, Mark, thank you, Emmanuel, um, thank you, Mantha, um, thank you, Gathi, and 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 Leslie. Y'all like this was um, this was honestly beyond. I mean, I, I also too walked in. I didn't really know what to expect, but but this was beyond what I what I would have even thought. So this was beautiful. Thank you. And yep, I go ahead and pass it on to Emmanuel. Right. Um, can you hear me? We can hear you, Emmanuel. Oh, okay. Right. Um, uh, thank you, everyone. I think for me, it's, um, you know, yesterday we, we had another meeting, another virtual meeting that was trying to address uh, the same issues. And we, we really had to stop and say, look, we couldn't make progress because of uh, some kind of feedbacks we had, and we really didn't know how to um, to approach uh, what we were going to do. And um, I was really looking forward to today because I was like, well, perhaps maybe from today's um, circle, uh, we'll get some ideas. And I think really, really, even though this is the first meeting for me, I think it has achieved so much. I now see clearly where we were going wrong uh, with the other method we were trying to use. And I've learned so much from everyone. And it's been a good time interacting, even though virtually. With, I, I now feel like I almost, yes, I do know some of you physically, but I now feel like I almost have met you all for such a long time, just uh, in, in just uh, two hours. So. Um, Thank you very much, everybody. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I look forward to subsequent meetings. And I know it's going to be a long-term kind of learning process. Uh, and luckily, uh, what the American College of Surgeons teaches is 
to be open to lifelong learning. And I think really this is uh, one of it. So thank you very much, everyone. Mamta. I don't know if it was better to go first or last. Um, uh, Cause now like I, I'm almost in tears. Um, so I, Thank you all so, so much for participating. And, you know, the reason that we had the circle, like, um, and had all of you amazing humans here um, is because we wanted to show at a level of the consultants and attendings what it's like to be able to be vulnerable. Right. So that our, you know, students who are still in training um, are not um, are are not they don't feel they're they're too vulnerable. They don't feel comfortable being in a circle and it's not fair to them to put put them in a circle. But I I just was I drove my father to see another doctor and he's going uh, in for a calf on Monday and he's deaf and this process of medicine and being treated even with having a daughter who is a surgeon has been so ridiculous when he's by himself versus when I'm with him that I don't know sometimes how people who do not speak English like a white American human being as clear as day get treatment in medicine versus, I mean, and mental health is out of, out of, out of the question. But this circle, I mean, you're right, Emmanuel, you and I've worked together and I've worked together with all of you and I like really, I just feel like we should have like a Zoom call often and like hang out and talk about things. And, you know, I feel like we're like, we're like besties, like we're like friends now, you know, um, because when you're that vulnerable with people, I think it, 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 it makes you closer. I feel like we can like talk about stuff. Like I can text you something and be like, hey, what do you think of blah, blah, blah. And I would feel more comfortable asking anybody at this in this group about something than I would with lots of people who I've spent time like lots of time with. And so thank you guys and the fact that Emmanuel you feel as though we made progress, right? Um that just you know, thank you. And I'm just so thankful to uh, Udoro and Leslie and Anita. Um, and I've got to give a shout out to Franklin Kosi Gay for, you know, telling me that uh, we should look at restorative justice. So I, I, this, this is beyond my wildest dreams. So thank you guys. Leslie. All righty. Uh, thank you everyone for sharing. Um, I, I do want to give a little quick activity. Um, so if everybody could spread your arms like this, we could do. What was your, what was your experience? Oh yeah. Um, you know, I, I wasn't able to facilitate and thank you for asking. <clears throat> um, I was being able, I had the opportunity to hold the space and seeing everyone come together because I personally feel like adults, like as a whole are not giving that opportunity to become vulnerable because maybe you have a child and you have to be the parent or maybe because your job is like, no, st stick up with it. It's okay. Just move it on. So I feel like a lot of the times adults aren't being able, they don't have the opportunity to become vulnerable. And I honestly felt like each and every one of you were vulnerable. I mean, we discussed about creating TikTok accounts. We discussed about all certain stuff and singing and singing in the shower. Um, and like Emmanuel said, Amamta, I feel like we have done some progress and having conversations like this 
we don't often have them, but we need to have them. Um, and that's something to always keep in mind. So thank you so much guys for letting me be part of this. And like I said, you are seen and you are heard. Um, and with that, I do want to close the circle with a little uh, thing that I just came up at the moment. So if you could spread your arms like, like that. And then we're giving each other a virtual hug now. <laughs> uh, so this was a little activity that I wanted to do to spread love a little bit. Um, and that being said, I'll pass it to uh, Kathy. Thank you so much. And thank you for that debriefing. We had two questions in the chat. One was a bit touched up on and uh, answered also by um, Anita. Uh, we have a question from Pavaranj Chana, uh, who I'm gonna give him a shout out also. He's part of our wonderful social media team who has been doing a lot of PR for this uh, webinar and uh, him and Jasmine Divazar have been working very hard. So Pavaranj wants to know, what do panelists think of the syphilis study at the Tuskegee? Um, I hope this question was not answered earlier as he had stepped out for a moment. So um, uh, any comments on this question at all? Um, Anita has responded by saying, thank you for raising this question. There's a difference in the case in terms of accountability as during President Clinton's time, uh, an apology was offered, whereas uh, with the Henrietta Lack story, unfortunately that has never happened. Anyone want to make any comments about this additionally? I just, can I add one thing? Um, it's sort of like we've never formally apologized for slavery in this country and for undoing the harm, you're not even acknowledging it. And so the family has even been victimized by the Oprah movie or by the book being written by a white woman and said, we, we don't get a share of any of this. And so, you know, again, John Hopkins saying, it's actually not our fault. We didn't have consent, consent protocols in place. Um, and we have not, that John Hopkins says, we have not profited from, and so there's all these like ways for you to get out of the responsibility. And it's like about damn time that just, they're asking for money. <laughs> it's very simple. They want an apology and they want money. And there's nothing greedy about that. Not when the whole world is profiting off of someone in their family. And so in Tuskegee's case, President Clinton said, this isn't enough but it's not good enough to stay silent. And I think in Henrietta Lacks' case, Henrietta Lacks's case, everyone's talking, but yet everyone's remaining silent. And so that's where I think there's kind of a difference. Okay, and then can I add one more thing as far as the Tuskegee experiment? So there was a, a recent um, social media event where we were talking about the, um, um, the testing of the uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccine. And there are two uh, French yeah, scientists who went on live TV and said we should test it in Africa yeah. right so this is where I where okay hold on hi. so we think we're past all that history right we're right there it is happening right now we are repeating history and you know people get upset about it and say oh that's a racist thing to say it's, it's inappropriate this is how science has been this is how medicine has been for so long is the exploitation of africans exploitation of black people expo exploitation of indigenous folks right so it's we, we talk about all the things that happened in the past um that we are not taught in school that we are not taught in in um, uh, in our training and we see it happening and everybody is surprised as if it's a brand new thing when two french scientists say let's you know test phase one or two trials in Africa, and then when it's, when it's perfect, you know, phase three trials, are they gonna be available to Africans? Right? So these are the questions, you know, when we, when we start seeing these things, I think this is where we start, um, where we emphasize history and say, we are repeating history, and this, we should not be standing for things like this. And, you know, we, we actually contacted the, the Lack family, we wrote a, a letter to them, um, letting them know that we were um, dedicating and we had named the session after her. Um, and one, I, I can't like not say anything at this point, sorry, uh, Kathy. One of the things that I would like to work on that comes out of this as, as an advocacy campaign um, is to, 
had Hopkins apologize. Um, that's, that's something I would really, really like to work on together as a team. And um, so maybe we can all work together on that um, as a united front. So um, they are wonderful. The, the family uh, did a lot of reading on, on their family. So, um, and I think that, you know, these studies, et cetera, um, the Tuskegee, what I realized um, is that there's, there's a first responders course that, that, that I've done that my, my team has done in Chicago. And I never realized why the journal was asking me a very specific question about what the demographic was of the teachers. And I was like, an Indian woman, a Korean woman, and a Pakistani woman. And I never understood why they asked that question. And I was talking to Anita about it. And I was like, well, the way that we build trust is I tell them why I'm there as a trauma surgeon from Northwestern and why, you know, what trauma means to me. And they tell me the same thing. And we go around. She goes, oh, you do a circle. And I was like, I do a circle. And she goes, you do a circle. She's like, didn't you read my book? And I was like, ah. <laughs> So, yeah, I, and people participated in our trial and people like, it was, it was very cool, but that, that trust building and listening is really important. So. Definitely. Um, I think the advocacy campaign is actually a great idea. Um, and I, I hope that we can, we can get support from anyone who's interested in following through with that. Um, I don't think there was any apology necessary for that. I think it's an important thing to bring up at this time, especially that we've been talking about her today. Um, I want to share something quickly. It was not planned for me to really contribute as much, but I saw um, a tweet from one of my colleagues, the chair for Incision Nigeria last night, and I want to sort of take a different vantage point on, on this issue of how we advance medicine and healthcare. Um, my colleague Nelson Udeme um, Abassi, he wrote uh, in regards to the recent article that has been out, and I think some of you have seen it, about global health degrees. He wrote, as I tweet, the battle of getting an MPH or MGH in NA or Europe amongst my colleagues in LMICs is intense. Some are not even aware of such programs in Africa. Funny how Global North keeps dulling expensive solutions to LMIC's health problems, and we never seem to progress globally. So I want all of us to take that in a little bit and think about how education and having access to that education impacts those communities and how these students who are trying to, or trainees who are trying to be part of the solution are stuck in a cycle of a problem now that, that perpetuates more and more issues. And instead of advancing, the healthcare is actually going to set them back. Can you put the uh, the tweet into the chat for everybody? Yes, of course I will. I will try. It's a picture, but I will I will copy it best as I can. So um, with that, I want to ask the second question, and I will post the tweet for everyone. The second question was from an anonymous attendee who asked, "In my practice, I have experienced patients not." Um, trusting me as a female surgical resident. How do you think we can improve on patient trust in physicians of color or female surgeons? Thank you. And Anita had asked, uh, out of curiosity, is there a space um, carved out for you as a resident to express that it's um, that in a place like a circle or elsewhere? So she wanted to know if this was something that the resident had been empowered to discuss with anyone else or in any other safe space as we want to talk about it um otherwise uh so talk I answer this yes. when when i was a resident in our our uh residency program we had a very small uh number of women uh training and so we had like a, a women's surgeons group um but it wasn't like a very touchy feely like group um, we would celebrate events, but it was more of a requirement as a female resident 
to be there. Over the course of time, now in our the the program I'm at now, um, you know, it's much more. Uh, it's it's much more accepted to talk about it. Um, I think that the other points that have been made are very valid. There are not very many females in leadership positions and there's not very many female leaders, female surgeons as well. Um, and I think that it totally happens, but I've had it happen both ways. I had a patient who absolutely refused to have me operate upon him um, and wanted a white male gray haired surgeon. And then I've had other patients who've said, I'm so glad that he got a woman um, because women, you know, have better outcomes and they take better care of patients. So I've, I've had it go both ways. All right. Can I jump in real quick? So, Cindy? yes. Sorry. So, um, I've actually, uh, I've had patients refuse my care because of my hijab. I've been called terrorist by patients. Um, and when I um, brought this up um, and complained about it, that it was a problem, I was told that I was being unprofessional by, com by bringing up this issue. Yes. So, so um, one of the things that I, uh, and, and there was a recent publication from the Journal of Vascular Surgery that actually talked about professionalism and how we define professionalism and how it's very subjective. So uh, I think that is one of the other things that, that um, as women surgeons um, and uh, uh, the bias that we experience, not only within our training programs and within, you know, from our colleagues, we also get uh, mis, um, um, treatment and uh, bias from our patients. And so one of the things that I ended up doing to kind of get over this is I... Um, you know, develop rapport with my patients. Um, you know, if, if a patient and, and the way I've dealt with it my, for my own, you know, um, mental health and well being is I will take care of every single patient. If, if they come in and they are unstable and they need my help, I will take care of them regardless. I've had patients yelling at me, cursing me, um, but they're unstable and they're sick, I will take care of them regardless. But if they are perfectly healthy and perfectly stable and they are just so bigoted and so biased that um, they don't want my care, there's no obligation for me to care for them, right? I will sign them, you know, transfer them over to another physician um, and I will go take care of my other patients. So, and I came up with that for my own well-being and for my own health because I didn't have a program that really supported me in that. And we had patients, you know, who would be hitting our nurses and nobody would do about it, anything about it. We would have um, patients threatening our, um, our uh, residents um, and our staff and nobody would do anything about it. So we kind of had to um, um, figure out a way of saying these are acceptable things, these are unacceptable things. And if this is happening, unless the patient is unstable and we have to intervene, then we're gonna step away and we're gonna get security involved. So um, that's one of the other things that I um, also talk about is there are a lot of times where, you know, a lot of institutions are not equipped to deal with this. They've never had to deal with it. And instead of figuring out a way to protect their staff, they do the opposite thing of, of protecting themselves and their names. And so how do we empower um, the personnel to say, no, you have a voice and these are the things that, you know, you can say to, to stand up for yourself and say, I will not work under um, you know, uncomfortable positions or unsafe positions. So I don't think we talk about that a lot. I don't think we talk about, um, you know, redefining what professionalism is. Like I was considered unprofessional because I chose to be a practicing Muslim woman, right? I was denied entry to the operating room because they didn't know how to make, you know, me sterile to, to get into an operating room. Right. So you have to just because the rules, just because we've always done it this way and it's never been done does not mean that, that those are the rules that we have to live by. Mm. So as far as being you know, a woman in surgery and not having that respect, you know, develop a rapport with, with your patients. My, my, most patients, you know, I, what I found is that most patients 
are fearful because they don't know. Well, right. When I make them feel comfortable and I, and, and I, and I tell them exactly why I'm there, a majority of them will be like, can I ask you where you're from? Like they're uncomfortable, but I say, yes, ask me, I'm from here. And you know, we talk about food and we talk about languages. So, you know, I, a lot of it is interpersonal communication and that's another personal development thing that we don't learn um, uh, very well. But if you try and develop that rapport with the patient and they refuse to, you know, to connect with you and say, no, I, I don't like you because of who you are, you know, unless there, unless there's an emergency, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't feel obligated. Thank you for those responses. And that was, I think, the last of our questions from the audience. So um, I think um, this pretty much brings us to the end of the webinar. I wanna thank everyone again for joining us today, for being part of the webinar with us today. Um, this is, as we talked about at the beginning, it is a uh, first step in a conversation. It is an introduction to a training that we are planning. Um, the training is going to be, at least for now, we have planned two sessions. Uh, and if the desire is out there, we'll be working to make it happen for more than two. But the first group that is going to receive the training is going to be the incision members, uh, the, the national working groups, the uh, international team, and the members of the Students for COVID team. Um, together, um, Students for COVID represents over 40 countries and incision now uh, 54 hopefully soon more. Uh, so we're very excited to have uh, a global outreach with this training. Um, the, sec the training, uh, for those of you who are listening today, uh, is going to be actually closed. It's not going to be broadcasted. It's not going to be recorded as we're going to have students and trainees involved. Um, and we want to create that environment where they can uh, feel safe and have open conversations and dialogues on this topic. For the second training, we're uh, going to have it open for um, the final year, the last two years of medical school, essentially the final year students, senior medical students, for residents and trainees, for physicians who have uh, started practicing over the last two years. We're going to open this up as a competition. Uh, we are only making it a competition because each training is limited in space. Uh, it is going to only have 50 uh, member capacity. Uh, and we'll be announcing more details about all the trainings that are coming up. The first one is planned tentatively for August 22nd. Uh, more will be posted about it. We'll be publicizing it. So please keep an eye out for that and sign up. Uh, I want to thank um, Anita, Leslie, Yuduro, and um, Ray as a whole family for sharing this experience with us, for um, allowing us to learn more about restorative justice and uh, showing us what a circle looks like and bringing this opportunity to us to have these open conversations. Uh, I want to thank Mamta, Emmanuel, Mark, uh, Kali, and again, Hidoro and Leslie for participating in this circle. Um, today, you set an example for all of us to be vulnerable, to have the uncomfortable conversations because it is necessary for us to start the process to share how we feel about it, no matter where we come from, what, what our past experiences have been, and uh, begin a process of healing. And hopefully that is going to lead to the change that's necessary. Um, Mamta, I saw that you were waving at me. I, if you have any final words, I'm passing it on to you. And again, um, I wanna also share that I was equally as excited and nervous about today. And I'm really thankful that you all enjoyed this process. And again, thank you for being here and, and having this experience with all of us. So, um, right. So those will be the two trainings. If anybody is interested in hosting uh, a training or holding space uh, for your institution or for your group, um, please email uh, Ray. Um, and I am putting the their email here in um, in the chat, and we'll post it also in. Uh, Facebook. Um, and I just want to say thank you. That's it. I just wanted to make sure that we uh, had Ray's information there. Great. So thank you again for being here today and for starting this conversation. Hopefully more will follow. And uh, wherever you are, please stay safe and stay well. Bye.